Thank you. That's a nice, warm reception. It's the kind of reception that big stars get. You're very nice. As a matter of fact, I must tell you, Michael, up to this point, I've been thoroughly enjoying the show back there, and I thought I really enjoyed your interview with Dick Emery. Mm -hmm. You know, he said something that I think every performer and actor would agree with when he said, you know, every actor or performer hides behind the character, but it doesn't have to be a really uh, out and out character the way Dick was talking about. I think every character that you play in a movie or on the stage, the actor hides behind. And I've always had a theory that I think that most actors are really shy people, yes. myself included. Really? And I think that the most difficult thing is what I'm doing now, to sort of be yourself. It's much easier to hide behind a character. Yes. I, looking actually at your, at your life story, it occurs to me that no Hollywood scriptwriter could ever invent it. Have you ever thought of making a film about your life? Well, no, not really. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've always, I once did an article, My Life is a B Script. And uh, I think it is. Uh, you know, I sometimes think that if you want to tell the truth, you write a novel. If you really want to lie, you write a biography. Because, <laughs> well, I mean, it would be difficult. Uh, uh, that's not, like most statements, uh, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's difficult to tell the exact truth. And my own thing, that uh, you started to indicate at the beginning, I almost heard the violins playing the poor boy from the depths of poverty. He rose to become <laughs> champion. You know, the violins are playing. It's sort of uh, corny, but in my country, and by the way, it's interesting because we both have accents, don't we? What, what, what is your... You have Yorkshire accent. accent. Yorkshire accent. Yeah, and I have, of course, you wouldn't guess it, but I have an American accent. <laughs> <laughs> no, but... Uh, as you were saying at the beginning, you know, uh, my story is so typical of so many people in the United States, yes. you know, who come from immigrant parents and you sort of work your way through college and you go to dramatic school and you are fortunate enough to go into the kind of work that you'd like to do. And it's, it's sort of a, but, what I call a corny American story. But nonetheless, too, I mean, there's poor and poor, isn't there? There's poverty, poverty and poverty. Well, I mean, how poor were you? Were your well, I don't want to... You know, I'm afraid Dick Emery, if he's listening, would, you know, feel very uh, humiliated. Because, you know, my wife once said to me, you know, Kirk, one of these days you're going to be shattered because you might meet someone who was poorer than you. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yes, I, I came from, I guess, Michael, what you'd call abject poverty. If not having enough to eat, you know, days where you didn't have food, I guess that's, that's poor. You were hungry poor? Yes, hmm. yeah. And, uh, and, and, and it's something, as a matter of fact, that's uh, intriguing, because I don't think there's any reason for anyone really in the world to be hungry poor. And I think that hopefully someday, some of our politicians in our country or other countries would certainly work out a way where there's no reason really for anyone ever mm. to be hungry poor. Mm. Yes. But you were one, you were the only boy, weren't you, in a family of six girls. That's right. I don't envy you that. Make real. something of that. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was going to ask you to make something of that. Well, uh, of course, I think that's quite difficult. You know, I not only had uh, six sisters and my mother, that's seven women, but my father and mother separated uh, at an early age. And uh, that left me with seven women, which I think was a, a very difficult upbringing, and I found going to college was really a form of escape. I found the environment really kind of smothering. Yes. And, uh, you know, I had mixed feelings. Why did I leave my father, who, by the way, was quite a, a character. He was a very powerful man, a peasant. Uh, he, he also drank a lot, which I think is a form of escape. And I've often thought that one of the bravest moments in my life was one day, I was just a, I don't know, I was about 10 years old, we were all sitting around the table. My six sisters, my mother and I, and my father was sitting, one of the rare moments that he was with us, and we were drinking tea in that time, out of a glass, Russian style, you know, and my father was breaking off a piece of sugar and <sighs> sipping the tea through, and everybody was frightened of him. He was just overpowering him, and he was in a mean mood. And I don't know why, suddenly I took a spoon, and I took it into the, filled it with the hot tea, and I Flicked it right in <laughs> Well, I tell you, he grabbed me and he threw me 
But I just felt so, I felt I did it, you know, and it, and it sounds strange, but that is so vivid in my mind, and it's almost, it was, it's almost like an act that I feel saved me, that I dared to do something, yeah. and when you're that young, you think, you know, you, you actually think you're risking your life, yes. you know? Yes. It's strange. I don't know what made me think of that. <laughs> How, I'm glad you did. It's, it's a very, very revealing story, yeah. actually. How, from that kind of background, though, did you ever uh, advance the notion in your mind that you might be an actor? Well, Michael, I think, as I said before, escape. I think most actors... Uh, you know, we all start, kids are the greatest actors of all. They, they're so natural. They pretend to be whatever they want to be. And I think you have to retain a childish quality within you. You know, it's a childish profession. You know, uh, to pretend to be a cowboy shooting it out with Burt Lancaster, a grown-up man. You know, you have to be childlike. And I think that uh, most actors, performers, go into that as a form of escape. It's a, really a continuation of your uh, daydreams, really. Yes. Uh, you, you went to college, as you mentioned earlier yes. on. Um, I mean, you couldn't afford to go to college. I presume that you worked your way through college. That's correct. You know, what sort of jobs did you do? Oh, I had all kinds of jobs. I was a gardener, and I worked as a waiter, and I did a lot of things. You worked in a carnival, too, didn't you? Well, when I was in... Uh, that was what I used to do during the summer. I was on the wrestling team. As a matter of fact, I was undefeated wrestler while I was at college and during the summer uh, one of the fellows on the wrestling team would be the mask Marvel and he wore that thing and he'd be up on the platform and then there was a crowd out there and they were challenging is there anybody out there who has the guts to challenge the mask Marvel and I then was playing the heroic role and I said I'll take him on and I jumped up and then we'd wrestle we'd have a wrestling match and then uh, we'd clear out the tent and they'd have a another bout, and then it was a fight to the finish, and I'd make like $10, $12 a night, and that, yes. <laughs> that was a way of making some money, and then we'd all go out. My masked Marvel friend and I would all go out and have a beer or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I also got some of my early dramatic training. Yes, I yeah. imagine so. They are some of the best actors in the world, all the <laughs> wrestlers, aren't they? Did you enjoy that time in the carnival? Did you enjoy the characters, the lifestyle? Oh, yes. The oh, yes. I think as a child, I always loved... Uh, I was attracted, like most kids, to a carnival. I mean, whenever a carnival or a circus came to town, I was always there to watch, yes. you know, watch the different acts. I loved the idea of a, of a train coming in with, and seeing the tents go up and watch the excitement that night. Yes, that to me was, I think, to most kids, and it's something that sort of stayed with me because, really, the profession I'm in now is quite similar to that. You, you were aiming, of course, at that time in your life toward a, a career on the stage, weren't you? You were yes. very much uh, stage yes. orientated then. Yes. Um, can you remember the, your Broadway debut? Oh, I certainly can. I mean, the first thing that I ever did on the Broadway stage was I came in at the end of the second act singing a telegram to Grace George and C. Aubrey Smith. That was my debut on Broadway. And then, as a matter of fact, it went steadily downhill because my next performance, I was an offstage echo. I wasn't even on stage. <laughs> there was someone on the stage who played a part of a soldier. The part that I wanted to play was going off the wars. It was Chekhov's Three Sisters. And he was saying goodbye to the forest and he was yelling, Yo ho! Yo ho! <laughs> That was my second performance. No, second performance. Yeah. How, how on earth, then, from these small beginnings, did you get to, the, to come to the attention of Hollywood? Well, you keep, uh, you know, you keep trying. And as a matter of fact, I kept, I was being, I was fortunate. I, I was in several Broadway plays. None of them were successes. And then a very dear friend of mine, Betty Bacall, who later became Lauren Bacall, was uh, talking to Hal Wallace. And I was in a play, and she said, look, if you go to New York, you got to look up this actor that I went to school with, called Kirk Douglas. And uh, he gave me my first offer, which I turned down at that time because I had no intention. I never thought of myself as a, a movie actor. I always thought, so in a sense, I'm a failure because I always thought I was going to be a Broadway star, which I never became. So it was only months later, out of desperation, when my wife at the time was pregnant with my son, Michael, who since then has done quite well, that I needed money, and I wondered if he still wanted me. And I called him, and the next day I was on a train to uh, 
Hollywood, and I did my first picture, The Strange Love of Martha Iris. And it's strange, of course, because <clears throat> in that picture, one or two subsequent ones, I mean, you played the softy, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, yes. yes. some weekly part. That one, I played the weak district attorney. It's strange, because I thought I was going to play the other part, which was the part Van Heffern played. Oh, and suddenly they said, no, no. And I played the weak, drunk district attorney, and I started off in movies as a weakling. That's right. And what changed you to the sort of tough image that you well, I've, became associated uh, with? Well, Champion. Yes, that's I good. I played uh, the part of Champion with Stanley Kramer. Yes. Carl Foreman. Well, it was a fun picture because my agents at the time thought I was crazy because uh, nobody knew any of these people uh, connected with Champion. And uh, MGM had offered me a co-starring role with Ava Gardner and Gregory Peck. And my agents thought I was crazy to turn that down to play this movie in Champion with a group of people that no one had heard. But I just, I loved the script and I loved the idea of playing a different kind of role. Mm -hmm. See, I'd played these weak characters and suddenly I played Champion and overnight I thought it, I thought it was a tough guy. That's right. <laughs> Did that lead to any problems in public? I mean, when one imagines... When well, you... yes, you know, uh, you forget that, uh, you see, to an actor, I think to most of us, it's very clear what's make-believe and what's reality. But I think very often audiences get carried away. And I remember after Champion one, uh, one day, I walked into a bar and I, you know, and people sort of recognized me. I was standing at the bar having a drink and I saw two tough fellas at a booth there kind of drinking. I couldn't hear what they were saying, sort of like he doesn't look so tough. And one guy put his glass down and I saw him walking over toward me, and I thought, oh, boy, here it comes. Now, what am I going to do? Jeez, if I hit him, I'll get in trouble. If he hits me, I may get in more trouble. <laughs> so as he came over, I slammed my fist down at the bar, and everybody turned around, and I said, anybody in this bar room can lick me. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody sort of laughed, and he kind of stopped, and uh, he turned around and went back to the seat. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's he very, had nothing to prove. That's right. Very disarming, totally. Yes. Uh, what about general recognition, though? Because, I mean, wherever you go, well, you're, you're very everyone identified. Has their, there's, I think that everyone has their crazy stories, right. and so many funny things happen. I remember I was r driving in a little car to Palm Springs where I have a house, and I saw a sailor, and I was in the, used to be in the Navy, and he was hitchhiking, so I stopped, and he ran up and got in the car. And he got in the car, he took a look at me, and he, he said, hey, he said, do you know who you are? <laughs> he, he wanted to tell somebody. Yeah. But I think that, Michael, it's, it always, you know, I'm just so intrigued with the reaction of people because, you see, the, they see something and suddenly the face is familiar. I was once rushing to a luncheon date and suddenly I heard a, a, a fellow across the street yell, hey! He said, gee, my favorite movie star. I said, oh, thank you very much. And I kept going. I said, I'm like, gosh, he says, I'm so excited. He says, you're my favorite movie star. He says, I said, thank you. He said, you know, he said, I, I, I'm so nervous. He said, your name went right out of my head. <laughs> he said, uh, uh, tell me, what is your name? I said, yeah, my, my name is Douglas. Yeah, he said, Douglas Fairbanks, you're my favorite movie star. <laughs> but I think, you know, all... I think all performers have uh, funny stories like that. As a matter of fact, uh, Bert Lancaster and I have a pact. If someone comes up to Bert and calls him Kirk, he acknowledges. If someone comes up to me and calls me Bert, you acknowledge it. Because I think lots of times it's a form of uh, a compliment. You see, a, a person recognizes the face. They've seen you maybe on, on the TV screen or in movies. And sometimes in their nervousness, they get the name wrong, but yes. really, Douglas Fairbanks. I must... You mentioned uh, earlier something I, I wanted to sort of develop slightly, that when you got to Hollywood, you, in fact, flew in the face of the traditional uh, notion of a young star arriving, which is to sign as quickly as possible with a studio and, and stay with the studio. In fact, you retained from a very, very early stage in your career an independence, didn't you, from studios? Well, when I first came to Hollywood, everyone was under contract with a studio. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me, now that's quite rare. But at that time, everyone was. Uh, I didn't have a contract. I've never had. Well, I had one contract with the uh, 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 Warner Brothers for a picture a year that I got out of. Fine, I couldn't take it. I didn't like it. And I did a picture for nothing to get out of the contract. So I've always been a loner in that sense. 
I didn't always like it because you really felt alone. Most people had their own group. They could complain about things, but they, they belonged to a studio. And uh, I never did. I worked in all different studios, but I never did have a, a studio that I belonged to. You, in fact, formed your first production company in about 1950s, wasn't it? 1956 That's or so. right. Yeah. I called my company Bryna, B-R-Y. As a matter of fact, that's my mother's name. Mm -hmm. And my mother, a Russian peasant, you know, I'd come home and she was so proud. Oh, she says, my son, you know, his names and lights. She was always bragging to all her friends. So one day I said to my mother, I said, listen, and she would always say, America is such a wonderful land. My son, he's a movie star, his name and lights. I said, Mom, you think America is such a wonderful land? It can put your name in lights. She started to laugh. I called my company, Bryna, and a year later, <clears throat> I took her in a limousine to Times Square, and I pointed out to her, I, there was a big theater opening, and in lights, it said, Bryna presents Spartacus. I said, you see, Mom? Your name and lights. And she said, America is such a wonderful land. <laughs> <That's lovely. laughs> yeah. What's the most dangerous uh, situation you've been in making a movie? Because you do your own stunts generally, don't you? I enjoy it. It's part, of, again, of being a kid. I try to be sensible because lots of times you get hurt doing something very simple. Uh, so I don't know. A lot of times the most dangerous thing comes out of something that you think is the simplest thing. Sometimes it comes out of a special effect where a uh, a bullet going into the wood where the splinters are supposed to go out that way and suddenly they yes. hit you in the face. Yes. But I've had a broken nose, broken fingers, I broke a rib. I've had different things happen. But I try to be sensible, although I can't resist seeing if, the, if I can't do the stunt. Yes. And also I think it gives more reality. You know, or usually audiences are so well trained in watching movies that they see a long shot and they see a close shot, <sighs> the heaving hero, and they know that someone else is done fake, the stunt. Yeah. I just finished a picture uh, before Saturn III that I'm doing now. I just finished a picture in uh, the States called The Villain, which is an out-and-out -out farce, and it's directed by uh, Hal Needham, who used to be a stuntman with me years ago, and I really enjoyed that because the whole picture is filled with stunts, and it was... Uh, Really, really enjoyable. Yeah. The one thing that characterizes your work uh, that's in, in every picture is, is this very intense manner that, that, that you have. Um, it, it really sort of comes across at you. Does that make you a, a difficult man to work with? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that intensity, though, uh, it, it is there because, you know, in, in, in America, there are quite a few comedians like Dick Emery or people who do impressions. And they always do in impressions of me showing that quality. For instance, we have a Frank Gorshin. He's yes, very good. He has a wonderful imitation. And I was once watching Frank Gorshin doing an imitation of me on a TV. And as he was doing it, I kind of was fascinated, you know, and I kind of was going along with him. <laughs> and my son Peter came by as a dad. He says, Frank Gorshin can do you better than you. <laughs> To go back and pick that point up that I made, in fact, I mean, it's, it, it is true, isn't it, that uh, among certain people in Hollywood, you wouldn't win a popularity contest, would you? I don't think so. I think, well, I think a lot of that is because, uh, see, I think I'm, I worked very hard. I've always been independent. I've, uh, as we said, I've never belonged to uh, studios. And, uh, you know, I've, uh, I, I like to think that over the years, things have mellowed, but I remember after my first picture, uh, I mean, the, the first picture that sort of propelled me into recognition after Champion, there was a well-known columnist called Hedda Hopper, mm -hmm. who after yeah. she saw the picture said, you know, Kirk, my gosh, he says, ever since this picture Champion, she said, you've really become a son of a bitch. <laughs> I said, no. I said, Hedda, you're wrong. I was a son of a bitch before champion, but you never noticed it. <laughs> so it is true. I said, I think very often, uh, the more popular you become, in a sense, the more well-known you are, the more, you know, there's a, uh, a spotlight being thrown on whatever you do, and all, whatever you do is exaggerated. And uh, I think, generally speaking, uh, faults, are much more interesting than virtues. 
a matter of fact, you told a story about Billy Wilder uh, saying, Billy Wilder has told many stories, he's a wonderful director. Yes. I loved, I did a picture with him, Ace in the Hole, and Billy Wilder tells a story when they were doing The Defiant Ones, which was a picture about a black man and a white man. Billy says, you know, he said, they first went to Marlon Brando to play in this picture. Marlon said, yes, but I play it, but I want to play the black man. Well, <laughs> then he said, he went to Robert Mitchum. And Robert Mitchum says, I'm not going to play any movie with any black fellow. He says, then they went to Kirk. And Kirk says, yes, but I want to play both parts. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, you know, in jokes, there's a little bit of truth. And uh, I think that I have always had a... Uh, see, I love making movies, and I love to work in all phases of it. I think that's probably why I organize my own company. Yes. Because I like uh, finding a property. I like finding directors. I like like Stanley Kubrick. I like giving Walter Matthau and George C. Scott their first jobs in yes. movies. I mean, I find that exciting. I love talent. And uh, I love the profession that I'm in. Talking about Kubrick, you made two films with Kubrick. You made Spartacus. And you made what I think is possibly the best anti-war film ever made, which is Paths of Passable, Glory. Yes. Yes. You, yes. You're, you're very fond of that movie, aren't you? Oh, I think, it's a, I think it's an excellent film, and I still think it's one of Stanley's best films. I, I had seen, he had done a little movie called The Killing, yes, which was a wonderful movie. Nothing had been done with that, and I was just intrigued with his talent as a director and wanted to meet him. And he had this uh, script, Paths of Glory, and of course, he couldn't get the money to finance it. And I read it, and I just thought it was a beautiful script and I said I'll get the money for it and I finally cajoled the uh, United Artists to put up the money and they weren't very willing to do it just as it took 15 years to do one for over the cuckoo's nest but finally we got the money and uh, Stanley made what I think is a, a great anti-war picture. It's, We've got it's a, a movie that will be shown so long as people watch movies. I mean, it's timeless because it's so good. You uh, know, for years it was banned in France. Yes, it was I know. Only until about, which amazed me because obviously it's just a, it's a, it's a true story based on a World War One incident. Right. But <clears throat> it's a, a good. It makes an anti-war statement. But it was only about five years ago that they permitted it to be shown. Mm. Right. Now, you're, you're obviously a, a man who's very proud of his association with the movie industry and proud of lots of the films that you've done. I'm proud, too, of, of your own performances in some of those movies. Yet, you've been there 32 years, made a lot of movies. You've been three times nominated for an Oscar mm -hmm. and never yet won one. No. Do you feel you should have won one? <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, no, it's never a question of do you feel you should. There's quite a few movies where I, I, I almost saw it in Detective Story and in Spartacus, a few other movies that I was definitely going to get nominated. You can't say you feel you should. You feel you would like to. I mean, I've won awards like a New York Film Critics Award, but I think the Oscar, it's, uh, it's given by your peers, and I think it's something that you'd like to. I don't think anyone can say feel that whether or not they should, because really it's, at best, it's very hard to determine who what performance is better than another performance? But what was the Unless one that... everybody was all was doing the same the same role. Yes. But what was the one that disappointed you most, though, at not, not winning of, of your nominations? Well, uh, well, Lust for Life, I think, disappointed me because people had led me to believe that I really was going to win. I'd gotten a New York Film Critics Award, so you tend to begin to think, well, I guess I will win. And I remember I was shooting, I was in G Germany, the time uh, shooting a picture and uh, and all the news people were sort of downstairs ready to rush in rush in on me when word came out that I had won the picture to get the winning smile of course I didn't win and they all sort of crawled away <laughs> and I remember my wife who wasn't with me at the time did a very sweet thing she had a, a miniature Oscar made up that she gave to me, she had somebody give to me in case I didn't win, which was from her and my son Peter. My son Eric hadn't been born at that time. Yeah. So that was the only Oscar that I've won. <laughs> and probably one that you treasure more than the, yes, the original. I, yes. I do. Can I, can I read a quote to you from a man who, in fact, made a, a movie with you? Uh, 
uh, whose name I forget now, Melville Shevelson. Shevelson, that's right. Who did uh, How to Do a Jewish Movie, wasn't it? That's right. Which yeah. is about the, the director of Cast a Giant Shadow, a picture we did in right. Israel. And uh, he says of you, um, um, summing you up, that the hung hungry, relentless battler of champion is still fighting, several million dollars later, slugging his way towards some invisible championship that contrives apparently to elude him. I wondered, A, are you still battling? And B, what that invisible championship was? Well, it's, uh, I think that's a rather uh, astute statement. Uh, I think it's true. I've very often have had people say, when I'm making a picture, they'll suddenly say, well, why do you work so hard? You see, they equate uh, money with either working hard or not working as hard. Well, to me, I, I love making pictures. The last picture when I did The Villain, I loved it. We were in Arizona, we were on location, and it's stimulating to me. Here I am in London making a movie, and I love it. Hmm. Uh, and as soon, the minute it gets monotonous, boring, and doesn't have that excitement, and you don't have that feeling of a challenge, obstacles to overcome something that you want to accomplish, I'll stop making movies. But you don't foresee that day happening for some time yet? Oh, not for about 30, 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've talked about all the things that you've done in, in movies and, and stage, and we've talked also about uh, working with Burt Lancaster. One thing, of course, that you did with Mr. Lancaster in London, I believe, uh, which is something you're not renowned for, is sing. <laughs> is that not so? Well, as a matter of fact, I suppose everybody, you know, the comedian is the frustrated tragedian and so on. Of course, I can't sing, but we were making a movie with uh, Lawrence, Sir Lawrence Olivier then, and they, there was a charity at the uh, Palladium. Of course, I just love the idea of being able to say, I played the Palladium. <laughs> so Bert and I sang a little song and did a little dance number. So we were able to say that we played the Palladium. Yes. That night. Oh, that's, that's a nice one for your grandchildren, isn't it? That's right. that granddad played the Palladium, yeah. yeah. What about, what was it? Well, we did a little number together. As a matter of fact, it was an old song. Let me see if I remember the words. London isn't everybody's cup of tea. Visiting Americans complain. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that I disagree. Cause I've a yen for singing in the rain Maybe it's because I'm a London That I love London so Maybe it's because I'm a London That I think of her wherever I go I get a funny feeling inside of me Just walking up and down Maybe it's because I'm a Londoner That I love London town We've proved one thing. I may not know how to sing, but I got a lot of guts. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking they could do the, uh, all the Maurice Chevalier roles, actually, with some <laughs> style and a voice like that. Thank you, Harry. Harry Stolomov. He, he coming in Kirk Douglas, Fred Astaire, Bing Crosby, all the great musicians. <laughs> <laughs> Kirk, you've been a very welcome guest on my show. Um, Thank you very much for, for coming on. I hope the next time that you're over that you'll uh, pay the compliment of coming again. Michael, I would enjoy it. I look forward to it. I know that, remember, we talked before a group of students That's quite right. a few National years Film ago. That's right, National Theatre, yeah. And I enjoyed it, and I really enjoyed this evening, and I hope we'll have a chance to do it again. Huh? Kirk Douglas. Thank you.